Hi, everybody. I'm David Coleman, Director of Product Marketing here at Extreme Networks. Uh, you have tuned in to a presentation about Wi-Fi troubleshooting basics. Here at Extreme Networks, we like to think we provide you a lot of easy to use tools to troubleshoot your network, especially through Extreme Cloud IQ. And we're actually gonna talk about some of those tools and capabilities of troubleshooting from the cloud. But that being said, it always helps to have a good understanding about Wi-Fi troubleshooting basics so you'll know how to use those tools. So let's go ahead and get started. Once again, my name is David Coleman. I'm Director of Product Marketing here at Extreme. I am Certified Wireless Network Expert number four. There is my Twitter address, at Mr. Multipath. Always looking for more followers on Twitter. The Wi-Fi community is actually very active on Twitter. Additionally, I am also the co-author of this big fat book about Wi-Fi called the Certified Wireless Network Administrator Study Guide. It is a vendor neutral study guide for a vendor neutral test about anything and everything about Wi-Fi, but about 70 to 80% of the people that buy it around the world buy it more as a reference guide. With that, let's go ahead and get started. And I wanna talk first about our what I call the five tenets of Wi-Fi troubleshooting. And we'll actually be hitting all of these throughout the, uh, the presentation here. But um, these have kind of served me well over the years. And number one is just follow basic troubleshooting best practices, move up the OSI model, um, always understand that most Wi-Fi problems are actually client-based and not necessarily the access point. Um, Wi-Fi performance, and this is a big one, Wi-Fi performance problems can usually be avoided simply with proper wireless LAN design. And the fifth one that we'll come back to all of these, but the fifth one is that Wi-Fi will always get the blame no matter what. So let's dig a little deeper. So troubleshooting best practices. A lot of these things are one-on-one, -on -one, but sometimes you have to remind people because a lot of times we'll get calls to GTAC or support and they'll just say the Wi-Fi doesn't work, but there's not enough information. So by asking questions, you can uh, help yourself and others troubleshoot your network if you run into problems. So um, simple questions like, when is the problem happening? Is it happening at a particular time of day or is it only happening at noon? You know, if it's only happening at noon, maybe somebody's turning on a microwave oven, which is wiping out your 2.4 band um, during the lunch hour. Um, where is the problem happening? So if you have a campus, for example, and you have multiple buildings and it's happening only in one building, then maybe it's isolated to one AP or a couple of access points. Um, does this, and here's an important one, does this a problem affect one Wi-Fi client or numerous clients? So if it's only affecting one client and everybody else is fine, I think you've isolated the problem, it's that one client. Does the problem reoccur or did it just happen once? And of course that can uh, get a little tricky because if it just happened once, if it doesn't reoccur, it's hard to replicate it and that makes it tougher to troubleshoot. And the favorite one that we always like to ask is did you make any changes recently to your network? And of course the answer is always no, but a lot of times we find out that, yeah, somebody did indeed make a change. So that's why it's good to have a log files of and change management processes in place. Uh, other best practices questions and, and uh, troubleshooting best practices. Number one, as you asking the questions, this will help you identify the issue. And once you've identified the issue, um, try to recreate the problem. And once again, all these happen as a result of asking the proper questions. And then if, this will also help you locate and isolate the cause and then figure out a way to solve the problem, you know, put in a plan of action and then test to verify that the problem has indeed been resolved. And then the last two bullets are just as important. Document the problem because it might reoccur and you might be gone and somebody else um, will appreciate that documentation and then always provide feedback to the end user that was having the issue. Now, let's dig um, into what I call my second tenant and that is troubleshoot via the OSI model. Um, so number one, you should troubleshoot a Wi-Fi network just like you troubleshoot a wire network. And that means go up the OSI model. Move all, all start at layer one and move to layer seven. You know, about 70% of problems happen at layer one. 
Uh, and another thing you should always remember uh, is that Wi-Fi, 802.11 technology, only operates at layer one and layer two. So why is that important? Because if you can prove that the problem is not existing at layer one or layer two, it's not a Wi-Fi problem. Um, and Wi-Fi always gets blamed for a lot of problems that are happening at higher layers. So that's why I like to troubleshoot the, uh, the OSI model, especially with Wi-Fi, because I can, if I can prove that it's not layer one or layer two, I can start looking at the higher layers. So let's get into this a little deeper. So once again, I mentioned Wi-Fi operates at layer one and at layer two, the physical layer and the data link layer, more specifically the max sublayer of the data link layer. At layer one, your Wi-Fi issues are gonna be anything uh, RF related, they could be antenna related or mounting related, they could be Wi-Fi drivers and clients. When you move into layer two, you start uh, dealing with things like anything security related, VLANs. And of course, when you move up the higher layers, it is no longer a Wi-Fi problem, it is something else. So at layer three and layer four, it's improper IP addressing, could be a routing issue, um, ports, firewall issues. And then of course, as you move into the higher layers, now you're starting to talk about applications, radius, Active Directory, DNS, DHCP issues there, not down at the lower layer of Wi-Fi operates at layers one and two. So I've actually used this slide for a long time, and that is uh, the client device is usually the culprit. When there's a Wi-Fi problem, it's almost always the client device. And you know, you see laptops, they have a little button on the side where you can turn the Wi-Fi radio off and on. Now, not all laptops have that, but every device typically has a way for you to disable the Wi-Fi radio. So always check, is it on? We get a lot of support calls where people say, I can't connect to the Wi-Fi, and then they find out they didn't have the Wi-Fi on. More importantly is this, and this is kind of a troubleshooting 101 at layer one, um, and that is, when you have a client issue, always before you move any further, always disable the Wi-Fi network interface, okay? Disable it and then re-enable it, okay? That's just 101. The driver is an interface between the Wi-Fi radio and the operating system of whatever device you're using, okay? Sometimes the driver gets discombobulated. So it's real simple, just disable and enable it. And it's amazing how often that will fix a problem with just one client radio. So let's talk a little bit more about client devices. Because I mentioned a lot of the problems happen are client related, right? So you hear a lot about everything's backward compatible, right? So new technologies like Wi-Fi 6 comes out, Nader 2.11 AX comes out, and everything should be backward compatible with all the old legacy client devices so they can still connect to the wireless LAN. The problem is that's supposed to be that way, but it doesn't always work out that way. A lot of times when new Nader 2.11 technologies are introduced, the legacy client drivers freak out. Okay, they just don't know how to handle these fields called information elements in the beacon frames that are being sent out by the access points. So they can't connect. So you, you implement these new technologies like fast BSS transition or 802.11ax and then some legacy clients just won't connect. So what is the answer to that? Um, the answer to that is to try to, when you upgrade your infrastructure, also ups, upgrade your clients. Um, and unfortunately, in the enterprise, that doesn't always happen. Um, the, uh, we'll see customers that will spend sometimes millions of dollars or at least hundreds of thousands of dollars on new APs and new networking infrastructure, but then they didn't update their clients and they have Wi-Fi clients that are 10 years old. I mean, there's still 802.11b technology out there. That's like 20 years old, okay? Um, so... Bottom line is we highly encourage customers to try to upgrade their clients. And we know that that's not always the easiest, but to try to do it at the same time that you're upgrading your infrastructure. You'll make everybody happy if you want to take, especially if you want to take advantage of the newer um, 
uh, bells and whistles that come with the new technologies. Now, that being said, in Extreme Cloud IQ, we have a view called Maximum Client Capabilities. And it's one of our customers and partners' favorite views because what it does is it looks at the probe request frames and the association request frames from all clients basically in your enterprise. And what happens is, is we can kind of build a, um, a high level view of the client capabilities of your client population. So um, do they support um, uh, uh, WMM? Are they, do they support multi-user MIMO? Do they support all the um, uh, <coughs> DFS channels? Do you have a bunch of 802.11b clients still out there? Hopefully not, get rid of them. And of course, you will find out that we really do live in a two by two by two world. Most clients are two by two, most handheld devices and even a lot, of, a lot of laptops. So this will help you identify your client population and plan and, and, uh, for better planning and better planning results in less troubleshooting. So let's, uh, we're still at layer one and uh, Let's just be honest here. The 2.4 gigahertz band is not a happy place. It's kind of a disaster zone. There's only three usable channels. It's impossible to prevent co-channel interference. Um, it has low SNR. Um, and then there's an oversaturation of 8 or 2 11 devices and all kinds of other interfering devices. Two point, your clients and your employees, they're not going to be happy in the 2.4 band. The 2.4 band should be considered a best effort band. Okay. Well, there's still a lot of IoT devices that only have 2.4 radios in it, but um, people and in general and devices in general, they're going to be in a much happier place at 5 gigahertz. There's a lot more channels. Um, all these channels are available, and we also highly recommend uh, turning on the dynamic frequency selection channels. Um, uh, even though um, you know there may be radar in the area, you can still uh, design around that. But having all these channels available will help you res um, resist things like um, co-channel interference. Um, it will help you um, um, have a better channel reuse pattern. Your SNR is a lot better. Um, there's nowhere near the interfering devices. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Most people know this, but trust me, they're gonna have a lot better user experience at five gigahertz five gigahertz, and things like voice and uh, 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 bandwidth intensive applications and latency intensive applications like voice, they need to be on five gigahertz. 2.4 gigahertz should be a, a best effort band. Now, speaking of frequency space, I think you probably all heard, if you haven't heard by now, six gigahertz is coming. So the FCC has opened up 1200 megahertz of new frequency space. Look at all those channels that are coming in 2021. That is a boatload of channels. So this is going to be a ha uh, even happier day. Uh, and even in Europe uh, as well, that's going to follow in other regions of the world, more frequency space is coming. Now, let's be honest here. It's going to take a while um, before, well, probably a long time before we start seeing clients that can connect in six gigahertz. And also understand that your five gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz clients will never be able to connect to that six uh, gigahertz band. But Having that new frequency space it will make uh, life easier. It'll be a great technology for meshing initially and eventually uh, another band of frequency space um, for all our clients. Um, as we move on, one of, one of my biggest tenets is Wi-Fi is always going to get the blame, okay? Now, um, you know, people kind of laugh at, at, at this, but it, it's true. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if the problem is your DHCP server staff. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, there's a problem with your ISP server. Put yourself in the you know, shoes of the end user, okay? The end user, um, they're connecting uh, with their iPad or their Android, and all they know is they can't get to Facebook. That's all they know, okay? Or they can't access, uh, get their email. Um, Wi-Fi is an access technology, and your end users engage with that access technology. So they're going to blame it. But that's why it's important to troubleshoot the OSI model, because if you can prove it's not a layer one or layer two problem, you can start zeroing in on the problems in the higher layers. So uh, let's talk, let's go back to layer one a bit. 
I mentioned this earlier, about 70% of problems are layer one, and we're going to hit on some of these in uh, various slides. So I'm not going to read all these bullets because we have various slides. So let's just jump into it. I already mentioned the client and driver problems, but a lot of layer one problems and Wi-Fi problems in general can be um, completely not even happen if you have proper Wi-Fi design. Um, and I cannot emphasize this enough. You know, um, just slapping up APs and turning them on and thinking it's going to be magic. You know, some people might tell you that that's not in the real world. Proper Wi-Fi design will re uh, reduce support calls. It reduces airtime consumption, co-channel interference, layer two overhead. Um, you know, basic uh, design 101 things like making sure you have NEG 70 or better cover. Cover DBM or better coverage um, and receive signal strength for your clients and SNR of 25 dB or better, like you see here on this slide. Um, proper design and I want validation surveys are important. They all cut down on your calls. So there's all kinds of really good professional tools out there. There's EchoHow, there's IB Wave, there's Air Magnet, there's uh, uh, Tamosoft. All of them are very good design tools that will help you with your coverage planning, your capacity planning, and your roaming design. I do want to invite everybody. Uh, there is another session, on-demand session, that we recorded um, for Wireless LAN Design Basics uh, here in, on the Connect site So, um, and with me. So when you're done with that one, go watch that one. So once again, uh, Wi-Fi design and wireless uh, LAN design if it's done properly and you have a good validation survey, it'll cut down on a lot of your troubleshooting. And that's kind of the whole point. So as we're still at layer one, RF interference is obviously a big cause of layer one problems, okay? More so in the 2.4 band, um, because there's a lot more interferers in the 2.4 band than there are in the five gigahertz band. But there's interferers there too. Um, so I highly recommend uh, that uh, you, if you own a spectrum analyzer, um, some really good ones out there. There's uh, Echo Sidekick and also the MetaGeek Wi-Spy, um, both great spectrum analyzers. Um, and uh, they will help you um, identify uh, different kinds of interferers, especially on the front end of things during uh, the initial design um, side of things. You can identify a lot of these RF interferers and get rid of them so they don't affect your wireless network. And so bring a hammer with you and get rid of those RF interferers. So another thing that causes a lot of troubleshooting problems is uh, the misnomer that high power is good. High power is not usually good. Now there's always exceptions to the rules, okay? Um, but sometimes, but most of the time, 30% or less power, transmit power from your AP is going to be sufficient to meet your coverage needs. High power usually results in a lot of problems. It will uh, definitely not meet your capacity needs if you only have three APs that need to service uh, 2,000 clients. Not gonna be a happy day, but maybe you can cover them, but you don't, you're not meeting your capacity needs. Additionally, uh, it will absolutely cause co-channel interference. It will cause the hidden node problem where you have one client that keeps uh, 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 interfering with other clients and can't hear other clients. And a big, big problem with high power is the roaming sticky problems. So uh, a lot, what will happen is your APs will be at much too high a power. A client will be um, mobile, they'll move, they'll move, and they'll be standing underneath a new AP, but they're still connected back to their original AP because they had such a strong signal. So it will absolutely cause sticky problems. You know, high power is, you know, there's all, like I said, there's always exceptions, but um, that being said, my recommendation is that you turn the power down, <laughs> okay? Um, and as I said earlier, a typical design, you know, as part of the whole design and planning process, but typically a third power or better or lower is usually sufficient in most uh, indoor deployments. Now, let's talk about bugs. Bugs are a layer one problem. And it often occurs after a vendor uh, has AP firmware updates. Now, companies like Extreme, we, when we 
put out new code, we do a lot of regression testing, meaning we make sure when we have new code, we test that all of the original things were continue to work, okay? But let's be honest, nobody is 100% bug free. We identify those bugs um, uh, when they are identified and then we squash them fast, okay? Um, but and I, we'd like to think that we do a good, a really good job of squashing them really fast as, as well as catching them before they happen. But every now and then one slips in, okay? So with that, if you're running into a bug, um, that's when you're gonna be working with GTAC. Supply your Wi-Fi vendor with packet captures and from Extreme Cloud IQ, there's a very simple way to extract the tech data logs from any access point. So this is a big one too. It, it, it's PoE. OK, and um, even though this is not a wireless problem, it's going to affect your wireless network. So I'm really big on that. Everybody should understand that careful POE budget planning is a must. So if you ever see a scenario where APs just start randomly rebooting, guess what? They're not. The first thing you should suspect is that they are not getting enough power. OK, so. Um, the good news with Extreme Cloud IQ, not only can you manage our APs, but you can also manage our switches. So you can get visibility into the POE budget, okay? Um, and um, know that if you're close to exceeding it, hopefully you've done proper planning that that does not happen. Uh, I am worried a, a, lot, uh, a little bit more and more about this because uh, APs are more and more have more radios in them. You're getting a lot of four by four APs, and you know, eventually we'll have tri-band APs, meaning they're gonna, APs are going to need more power. And as they need more power, as we start doing replacements, it might start exceeding power budgets. So uh, keep an eye on your power budget, and careful planning is important. Um, another, another little trick with your PoE switches, and this is just an old admin trick for, that goes back many, many years. If for any reason you have an AP that is just locked up for whatever reason, or it could be some other uh, PoE powered device, um, from Extreme Cloud IQ, what you can do is you can power cycle the port. So the switch might be somewhere in Illinois. You might be based in, uh, you know, uh, Mexico, okay? Um, and uh, you log into your cloud account, you go to that switch port where the AP is plugged into, and you just power cycle, and it forces a reboot. So that's just an old trick um, that a lot of people uses, but, um, you know, it's a troubleshooting trick that everybody should take advantage of, and the power of the cloud makes it even easier. Um, as I mentioned, uh, PoE problems are going to grow as more and more APs uh, have more radios, 4x4x4, uh, um, and as well as tri-band radi uh, radios. So it's time to move up the OSI model. We've kind of hit layer one, and let's kind of go to uh, talk about layer two now. So layer two, this is uh, where roaming happens. Uh, we're also going to talk about layer two retries. A lot of connectivity problems are at, at uh, the MAC sublayer of the data link layer, mainly due to security mechanisms. Um, and we'll talk about troubleshooting security capabilities, both PSK and 802.1x. So let's talk about all the layer two issues that you might run into um, that are Wi-Fi problems. So number one, let's talk about roaming. Um, roaming occurs at layer two, as I mentioned, it's based on uh, uh, an exchange between the client and the uh, uh, from an original AP to a new AP. Um, it's actually layer one and layer two. Um, so a lot of times roaming problems are client-based, which means they're drivers problems, okay? And that's a client problem. That'd be a layer one issue. Uh, a lot of roaming problems, as I mentioned earlier, are due to sticky problems. And that's usually due to bad design and the power being turned uh, up too high. Okay. Um, a lot of layer two problems occur simply, once again, as I said, uh, due to bad design and I'll, a lot of times due to a misunderstanding on how roaming works. Clients make the roaming decisions. APs don't tell clients to roam, despite what some vendors might tell you. Uh, we can APs can assist in that process, but clients make the roaming decision. And that's why you need to understand that you could be holding an iPhone in one hand and an Android in another, and you go walking from one AP to another, and one might roam before the other. So good roaming design really helps a lot of this. 
providing proper primary and secondary coverage. Um, also, if clients support things like 802.11k AP neighbor reports, they're probably going to roam better. And of course, if you have to roam across layer three boundaries, make sure the clients actually support 802.11r uh, mechanisms for uh, seamless layer three roaming. The other good news is in Extreme Cloud IQ, we have a view called Client 360 View, where we provide you a, um, a historical view of your client's roaming trail. Um, and you can see uh, chronologically a client roaming from AP to AP. And you can see the association, the authentication, and even into the higher layers when it's getting an IP address and doing a DNS query. And you can also see how long that roam time took. You want that roam time to, to happen in uh, under 150 milliseconds, closer to 50 milliseconds, if, if you have any uh, uh, time sensitive of application. Um, but the good news is we can visualize this uh, historically. Uh, we have a 90 days worth of visibility. And if you haven't heard already, we've recently announced unlimited visibility and unlimited data available for Extreme Cloud IQ. So having that roaming trail visibility is uh, important and can help you troubleshoot better. So let's talk about layer two transmissions. This is kind of a, a, a Wi-Fi 101. So whenever an AP sends a unicast frame to a client device, or it could be the other way, it could be the client sending a unicast frame to an AP, uh, there has um, that unicast frame is sent down, in this case, to the client. And then there is a CRC check. And then that CRC check, what it does, it actually looks, it's a basically a data integrity check for the unicast frame. Okay, um, what happens then if it passes, the receiver sends a, um, a layer two acknowledgement frame. Okay, so all unicast traffic is acknowledged, broadcast and multicast uh, traffic is not. And think of this as a uh, delivery verification method for Wi-Fi. Um, that's just the way things work. But what happens if it fails? Uh, what happens if uh, a transmitter sends a unicast frame, okay, and then the CRC fails? And if the CRC fails, guess what happens? No ACK frame is sent. There is no ACK frame sent by the uh, receiver. So, of course, what has to happen? A layer two retransmission from, the, um, this case, the transmitter. Layer two, there's always a certain amount of layer two, uh, layer two retransmissions, but layer two retransmissions cause a lot of problems in terms of performance in Wi-Fi networks. So let's talk about that a little bit deeper. So it's all cause and effect, and let's talk about the, the negative effect if you have a high percentage of layer two retransmissions. Um, number one, late throughput is gonna go down. So if you're having to send a frame over and over and over again, it consumes airtime. And if it consumes airtime, your throughput goes down and the user experience goes down. So shared medium, and, and basically this can affect everybody. Um, and of course, it's also gonna cause latency to go up. So applications like voice that require the timely delivery of packets is going to have a negative impact. Now, what are the percentages? It depends very often who you talk to. We can visualize uh, layer two retries in Extreme Cloud IQ from both the client and the AP side. But, um, uh, you know, a good rule of thumb is when you start exceeding 10%, then you might start running into problems. And absolutely, if you're up to like a 20%, uh, um, there, you absolutely have um, 20% layer two retries, you, you're definitely going to have throughput and latency problems. And if you're doing things like voice grade networks, you want to try to get those 5%, uh, you want to get layer two retries down to about a 5% level. Um, so, and some other effects of layer two retransmissions if they're too high. It definitely has a huge impact on voice and other time sensitive applications. Latency is the time it takes to deliver a packet from one source device to a destination device. Layer two retries um, by sending frames over and over again will increase latency and it will cause echo problems with voice. Layer two retries will also affect jitter and which is a variation of latency. So jitter measures how much the latency of each packet varies from the average. And jitter will cause 
choppy audio problems. So you start getting those gaps in the audio. Another side effect of high layer two retry rates, it will do the retries over and over. It'll drain the battery life of your mobile devices. Um, so um, bottom line, want to try to keep those uh, retries down. And because otherwise, if you start having either of these two problems right here, it's going to be due to layer two retries. So what exactly causes the layer two retries? Well, there's a lot of different things. Uh, the number one cause is RF interference. Okay, so any kind of RF interference is going to, uh, number one, cause um, uh, a medium back off as well as uh, retries and corrupt due to corrupted packets. So once again, you got to eliminate those um, non-Wi-Fi interferers and get rid of them. Okay, find them and get rid of them. That's why spectrum analysis is important. The number two cause is a low SNR. Um, you typically want uh, an SNR of 20 dB or better. If you're going to do voice grade, you want 25 dB or better. And to use some of the higher qualm modulations, you need 20, uh, 29 dB or even 35 dB if you're going to be doing 102 poor qualm. Bottom line is, um, very often, low SNR is due to bad design. Okay, um, and you can prevent this problem, um, layer two retries due to low SNR with good design. Same thing with adjacent cell interference and very often with the hidden node problem as well. Bad designs will prevent these layer two issues, layer two retry issues. So let's talk about some more layer two uh, troubleshooting uh, aspects. Security mechanisms all operate um, at layer two. PSK and 802.1x. Now we have a tool in Extreme Cloud IQ called um, Client Monitor, and it's a proactive 24 seven uh, troubleshooting analysis tool that will basically uh, signal to you whether or not you have uh, connectivity problems due to security authentication failing. PSK or uh, Extreme Network's proprietary security solution private pre-shared key are very easy to troubleshoot. It's just a, a passphrase, a passphrase mismatch. So they're typing in the wrong passphrase on the device. And we will tell you that um, that's what's happening in uh, our client monitor tool in Extreme Cloud IQ. But if you ever just were looking at the frames or the packets and you saw that the four-way handshake that is used to set up the encryption key fails and you're using PSK or PPSK security, they're typing in the wrong passphrase. Um, now, 802.1x is a lot more complex, and I can do, uh, we can do many other sessions on 802.1x, but we don't have time, but it is a port-based access control standard that defines an authorization framework. That framework is the supplicant, the authenticator, and the authentication server. Um, it fully integrates with LDAP, um, and it also uses a layer two protocol for authentication, also involves certificates, um, and the certificates are used to create a, a TLS tunnel for the user credentials or exchange between the supplicant and the authentication server during the 802.1x process. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in 802.1x, and I've blogged extensively about this, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this right now. Um, 802.1x is complex, but the good news is our client monitor tool can help you isolate a lot of these problems as they occur. So for example, uh, the radius communications between an AP and a radius server uh, is typically three or four problems. The number one problem, it's going to be a shared secret mismatch. So the shared secret between the AP and the radius server, um, if the AP and the radius server aren't talking, they probably have typed in one, on one of those two devices um, the incorrect shared secret. Could be incorrect IP settings on either the AP or the radius server. Could be a port mismatch. Radius uses ports 1812 or 1813, but the, somebody may have configured some uh, legacy radius ports like 1645 and uh, 1646. They have to match on both sides. Uh, and there can also be problems between radius and LDAP. So if the radius cannot talk to your LDAP database, that's another backend problem. The good news is our client monitor tool can help you zero in on these problems. If you're, and we also have a test tool called Radius Test Tool that actually allows you to test the radius query from an AP to any radius server for, directly from an AP via the cloud. Now, if you can, once again, be smart about your troubleshooting. If you can prove that it's not a back-end problem, then guess what? 
it's going to be on the front end, uh, meaning it's going to be a client problem, a supplicant problem. And very often it, it because it's going to involve certificates. So in the client monitor tool, if you see that you're having a problem setting up your SSL or TLS tunnel, there's uh, three or four things that can happen that are the cause of this. It could be an expired certificate. The root certificate is installed in the wrong store. Uh, certificate store on the device, uh, incorrect clock settings uh, because certificates are time-based, or could be mismatched EAP protocols because there's about 20 different types of EAP, and if they don't match on the supplicant in the radius server, not going to work. So a lot of these problems occur. Um, 802.1x is complex, but uh, we do give you the troubleshooting tools to help you uh, uh, isolate some of these problems, including the um, issues with uh, certificates, which adds a lot of the complexity to 802.1x. Now, there's other supplicant problems as well. Um, and once again, maybe uh, if you see that the supplicant that the tunnel is up and the supplicant is indeed talking to a radius server through the AP, then it's probably going to be one of these four problems. So you have an expired password or user account. Uh, the supplicant uh, maybe they're typing in the password as opposed to using a cache one, so the wrong password. Maybe the user has been removed from the LDAP database. And one that we actually see quite often is sometimes um, on the client side. You're doing user authentication at, in your enterprise, but on the client side, they've accidentally configured it for machine authentication or vice versa, and then you have a problem. So another big metric for troubleshooting is channel utilization. Okay, And uh, we can visualize this uh, from the access points perspective um, uh, about what's going on in terms of the channel utilization for all your APs. And uh, bottom line is if a channel or an AP is oversaturated, it's going to affect performance. So here's some really good metrics to live by. 80% um, channel utilization is going to impact all data transmissions. It's just too high. Okay, 50% uh, is going to impact uh, applications like high definition video traffic, and voice is highly susceptible to uh, high uh, channel utilization. So, if it's overutilized, as yes, little as 20% channel utilization can have a negative impact on voice. That's why you never want to put voice on the 2.4 band, put it on the 5 band. Um, so, what can cause high channel utilization? Well, number one, bad design. Co-channel interference can cause this. Uh, number two, um, it could be something like um, you're um, simply have not done really good capacity design and you have too many clients connecting to a, an access point when they are using too much or a lot of high bandwidth applications. So pop, proper capacity planning is important as well. So always keep an eye on your channel utilization and sometimes very often uh, the fix is you're gonna have to maybe put in another AP um, or redesign a little bit. So we've talked about Wi-Fi troubleshooting, but guess what? You know what? I promise you, even though Wi-Fi is always gonna get the blame, I promise you about 60 or 70% of the time Wi-Fi is not the problem. Uh, maybe even higher. It's usually an upper layer problem. So if it's a layer three problem, it's going to be a networking problem, routing problem, misconfigured IP addresses. How many times have you run into problems with firewalls? Okay, so it's layer four, firewalls blocking something. And of course, as we move into the higher layers, you have application problems. So it's maybe an application server is down. Okay. Um, now, we do have one excellent tool in Extreme Cloud IT. Q that will help you prove that the problem is on the wired network and not as the wireless network. And extreme customers and partners um, have been using the VLAN probe tool in Extreme Cloud IQ for a long time. And it is a basically a lifesaver. So imagine this scenario right here. Imagine uh, we have uh, uh, three SSIDs in a school in this example, and each SSID is mapped to a different user VLAN. All those user VLANs and as well as a management VLAN are tied to very specific uh, IP scopes uh, that are then configured up on your DHCP server. Of course, in this case, we have all the VLANs uh, trunked on an 802.1Q trunk between the access switch and the EP. 
but the AA client is not getting an IP address or it's getting one of these 169 uh, PIPA addresses. So uh, how can you troubleshoot this? Well, in Extreme Cloud IQ, um, right off the bat in the client 360 view, uh, in our topology view, you'll actually get some sort of indication. So right here, you see my client device right here is not getting an IP address at all, or maybe it's, once again, it's gotten one of those 169 PIP addresses. So if you see that, that's your first indication if the, if the end user hasn't already called you, <laughs> uh, upset that they're not connecting, you know that you probably have a higher layer problem. So how can you troubleshoot this? Well, you note that the device is connected to the AP, so Wi-Fi is working fine, but it's a layer three problem. So guess what? We'll do our VLAN probe tool. So what you can do is from that access point is you can run a VLAN probe to probe all the known VLANs um, um, that are trunked from that switch to that AP. And you can see right here, that, that client that was supposed to be getting an IP address from VLAN 5, well, VLAN 5 doesn't exist and there's no associated subnet to it. So that's your first indication that there's a wired network problem. And where's the problem gonna be? Well, um, it, bottom line is uh, it could be uh, an IP helper address is misconfigured. More likely, there's an issue with the DHCP server, so it's out of leases. Maybe it's down. Maybe it's not configured properly. But I can tell you, 90% of the time, boom, the problem is going to be at the access switch. So somebody has uh, changed the switch configuration settings. The VLAN is not tagged. The VLANs don't exist on the uh, uh, on the uh, switch or the switch port is an access port and it's not trunked, okay? Cannot tell you how often our customers and partners and RSCs alike have used the VLAN probe tool to isolate uh, wired side problems in a heartbeat and once again prove that it's not Wi-Fi even though the Wi-Fi is what's getting the blame. So we have we have lots of tools in Extreme Cloud IQ, and we don't have time to go over every one of them. But I do want to give a shout out to this troubleshooting tool that's for the power user, um, and that's our SSH proxy tool um, in Extreme Cloud IQ. Now we have, I would be willing to say, ninety five percent of problems. So you can use the UI, the user interface in Extreme Cloud IQ to use the troubleshooting tools from there to troubleshoot either. Um, manually and sometimes automatically, like the client monitor tool, right there in Extreme Cloud IQ. But sometimes, you know, you're never going to have 100% visibility like you do in the CLI. So we provide you the best of both worlds. You can have troubleshooting from the user interface of Extreme Cloud IQ, or if you want to do advanced CLI troubleshooting commands, you can do that from a cloud via a proxy using your own terminal emulation application like a putty, for example. So we basically set up a proxy through the cloud. Uh, basically what happens is we send a CAPWAP message to the access point to the cloud and have the access point uh, start an OR switch, for that matter, start an outbound SSH session back to the cloud that is then in turn proxy back to your, lap your laptop. And then you can start doing some advanced CLI troubleshooting. So uh, this is a Pretty cool tool, very powerful tool um, uh, to do the, um, the advanced CLI commands and logging commands and in case you do not have the visibility in the cloud, uh, even though you have quite a bit. So as we wrap things up, uh, we'll put in a, a quick plug for this little ebook that I wrote um, about this topic. Uh, it's called Wireless Land Troubleshooting um, and uh, you can download it for free. Um, if you want to just, while you're watching this presentation, just take your smartphone, hold it up uh, to that QR code, and it'll take you straight to that URL. Or just type in that URL to your browser, and you will then uh, be able to go download um, a 80-page booklet um, about the subject matter of this presentation. So we'll hope you'll take advantage of that. Um, and with that, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, for attending this presentation and for attending Extreme Connect. Once again, my name is David Coleman, and we hope to see you again soon.